Hello and welcome to the High Maintenance Hippie Podcast. This is your host, Ashley from Ashley Taylor Wellness. On this podcast, we talk about all things beauty, health, wellness, and optimization. Being a high maintenance hippie represents not being boxed in, as I strongly believe that one size does not fit all. I'm a nurse turned coach and I have learned so much about both conventional and alternative options and I want to help you expand your options. I'm here to inspire you to learn new ways to improve your quality of life and to take your power back. I'm so excited that you're here, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of the High Maintenance Hippie Podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Julia Britz. She is a naturopathic doctor who has helped many people taper off of psychiatric medications. And she has such a wealth of knowledge, so thank you for being here today. Ah, oh, thank you. I'm really excited. I'm happy you have a podcast, girl. I listen to you talk all the time. I love it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, you've really helped me a lot, too, so I'm really excited to share what that has looked like. And obviously, I had a conventional background, and that didn't necessarily meet all of my needs. I was someone who was not a stranger to psych meds, perhaps a time and a place, but maybe they don't always help people. And... There's a lot more that can be done. So I'm really excited to talk about that. Do you want to start with the bioresonance scan that we did? Oh, yeah. Let's start there. Um, that was that was really cool, actually. I was really happy we did that. Um, I know you're going through a lot at the time, emotionally yeah. and physically, and mm-hmm. you're very open about that. So I was mm-hmm. really curious to see what was going to come up from what I knew about you, what you would disclose to me, and then also what maybe we hadn't talked about yet. So, yeah, you remember? do you remember that the first time we did that? Yeah. Can I be totally frank? I am a skeptic of those things because perhaps my background or uh, muscle testing or just bioresonance scans. I'm like, I don't know. I'll give it a try, but I really wasn't expecting much. And then we got on a call and I started taking notes and I started to get really skewed out a little bit because some of the things that came up were emotions and like things that how would somebody know that? So, um, can you explain the process a little bit more? And I just remember sending fingernails. Yes. Um, so okay. people can send yeah. me fingernails or hair and I'm looking for the DNA to assess. And I really wish I had a better way to explain how it works. But the truth is, I don't know if anyone really knows um, because it's it's so based in this entirely different world we don't see, you know, and I always think of it like this and I, I swear I'll get back to the topic, but do you ever walk into a room and within an instant, you know, if someone's mad at you and it's this yeah. feeling in your nervous system, you pick it up and someone may not even be in your vicinity. So there's something about our entanglement with our electricity in the body. And that's what this machine does is it looks exactly at that. So it sends 150,000 different electronic signatures through DNA. And as soon as it finds some sort of congestion neurologically, which is the best way I can explain it, Mm -hmm. um, it sends it back to the computer and it lets me know specifically how that's manifesting, whether it's a physical issue, an emotional one or a spiritual one. And you have been doing this for a while, correct? Yeah, I started apprenticing many, many years ago and I'm Mm -hmm. glad I did because I, wanted to learn about it before I knew I wanted to be a naturopathic doctor. I was considering other fields and it's such an odd system because you have to get out of the framework of the Western medicine model, Mm -hmm. uh, which takes a second because we're all indoctrinated into that. And what I tell people is it's not quantitative testing. So it's not like you want to look for, say, testosterone. You could request, hey, I want to look at testosterone and you look in the blood and you can get an actual number back. It's quantitative. Mm -hmm. Um, this, I can't do that. So essentially it's giving me the qualitative information of what the body, the innate intelligence really wants us to know. And it sounds very out there because it kind of is, but that's why I love it. It's why I do what I do because I got better with this. And I thought, you know what? I didn't get better with Western medicine. Not really. So I decided to become a doctor and I love this technology. It's been around for a long time. It originated, um, it's hard to say, but they think back around the 50s, Dr. Vo, he was this German doctor. He, he, he really liked the principles of homeopathy, which okay. is a lot of energy medicine. And he really liked um, Chinese medicine, which has a lot to do with also energy, meridian work, and where things are located and stored in the body. So he mapped those out together, which is kind of bananas. And he used an ometer to figure out how that translated electronically, frequency-wise. And then, um, boom, bam, boom, we have a machine. 
So it's been a lot of prototypes and all that stuff. And so this has been uh, quite a few versions in. So it's really amazing how it's come to be and how we can use it now. So you gave me my results and I'm the type of person who still has that skepticism, which I think is healthy just to, I don't, how do we really know? And so you mentioned low testosterone and some other things. So I had a Dutch test performed. I also had blood work performed. And the things that you mentioned were actually on my regular labs and regular tests. And that's how I also became open to muscle testing because I heard about it probably 17 years ago. And I'm like, okay, uh, this is so weird. <laughs> and then I saw someone maybe five years ago who is so skilled in that. And I even left her office. I'm like, you're a quack. This is crazy. And everything that she would test would come. I just had to see that data. And then I'm like, okay, I, after so many years of having the muscle testing and then having things confirmed, I'm like, okay, maybe there's something to this. And I just can't understand it because of the limitations of perhaps my training mm -hmm. and just what I've been told is what's out there, but it's so cool. I was blown away. It, it is really cool. And, you know, I think anyone that goes through naturopathic medical school, nursing school, medical school, osteo, you name it, mm -hmm. you know, we do learn the evidence Ba evidence based model of medicine, meaning you have to have research to back this up. And if you don't, it's not credible. Now, the biggest problem with that is okay, well, who's funding it? And they have a jillion biases, blind or not. You know, most of the research is based off of pharmaceutical interests because that's the Western model is, you know, pharmaceutical medication. And that to me is so incredibly limited because if there's no study, it's worthless. And in natural medicine, medicine there's hardly anything because it's very you know, patent laws go in and out in terms of their lacks in how much you can actually do um, and where we are at in society about that kind of thing. But essentially, that's why these studies in, in herbs are terrible. You know, for example, kava. It's a great example. What, they'll, what they've done is take out the kava lactones, which is an alkaloid, and they gave people a really huge dose, which no one would ever get by drinking kava tea. They go, wow, that's really toxic to your liver. Uh, yeah, it is. Don't do that, you know? Yeah. But if you have the cub itself, just the root, like, it's not going to do that to you. But that's what happens in the Western models. We go, we have to isolate a compound and use this one compound, see what affects this one thing, and then we have this result. And that's just not naturopathic medicine, so we can't look at it that way. So when people tell me, oh, you know, you don't have enough research, it's like, yeah, we don't. We don't have the pharmaceutical interest, and we don't follow the model. That's why, in my opinion, we're different. And it is different. And here's another example that's not related to this. When I was covered head to toe in hives, I mm -hmm. saw um, five doctors. I was on nine medications. Mm -hmm. It was just unbearable. I just wanted to sleep the whole time because I was suffering so much. And I saw a DO who suggested IV ozone therapy. There wasn't research at the time that I was familiar with. She was, she was able to administer that under a study and mm -hmm. as being experimental not FDA approved. And I said, at this point, fine, I'll try it. And within two sessions, it changed everything for me. So mm -hmm. I could have waited for a study. It was a risk that I chose to take. And I'm all about people doing what's right for them. And if it, you're not comfortable with that, wait for the study. But I didn't want to wait to get my life back. So I was willing to try something outside of the box. And that's when that box really started to open. And I have become more open to these types of things. So what would you say to someone who is skeptical about it? I would say if you're, if you're too skeptical, don't do it. You know, okay. like don't like take a beat, you know, do what works for you. Yeah. Um, cause it is really out there, you know, it's a very different type of therapy. Um, and that's because it's sort of a bridge between analysis and testing and treatment. Because when I use this type of device, there's the first part where I'm getting an assessment of the body on a comprehensive level. I'm saying, oh, you know what? You're storing this emotion here. Your testosterone's down here. What's going on? Like, and we're trying to piece this together to figure out what's happening all at once. Then what we're going to do based on that information is I'm going to Maybe I go, oh, wow, you've got this certain thing. Like in your case, we found that you had strep mutans, higher numbers in the brain, wanted to drain those out. So I thought, okay, what herbs would I use to do that? Then I can test them against your DNA and see which ones actually work better for you neurologically. So 
it takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. And that's one reason why it's a very unique thing to do. I did a little video on my website just so people could get a little more information. People want to understand. And when you have anxiety, OCD, mental health stuff, one way we cope is through research. And we go, how do I control the information and logic my way out and figure it out? And we get very smart. And most people with those things are very smart people. So when it comes to stuff like this, they go, well, I don't know how to figure that out. I can barely explain it. So it is out there. And, um, but I would say if someone's curious is if you suffered a long time, be okay with being a little experimental because it will take things that you try that will not work. And some things you try will work. And you have to be a little bit brave to figure out what those things are and give it a chance because you know, it's, to me, it's not good enough to be given a medication and then say, hey, I, I don't think this works for me. And the doctor goes, well, there's something wrong with you, not the med. That's not okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm an open book. What are some of the things that came up? And it's, and I'll back up and say, it's not just, okay, mental health is the challenge that I struggle with the most. Yes, I had a physical health crisis in 2018, but uh, I would say depression is an anxiety. Um, but really dark, dark depression. And I've learned a lot about what helps. Definitely sunlight. Um, we'll get to jet lag. And sleep is so important. I have to be moving my body. I have to do all those things. But it can show up as a mental health issue. But it doesn't mean that there isn't something physical, spiritual, or emotional also contributing to that. And I think that's the piece. I mean, that's definitely the piece that we're missing in the conventional care. It's like... It's a physical symptom. Here's a physical treatment, case closed, and there's nothing else to see. But what if there was more? Exactly. And people all the time with very physically um, originated problems, like a thyroid condition, that might only manifest with anxiety. They might get funneled into psychiatry. So, oh, it's a psych symptom. You go over there. Right. And that's terrible because then that person might be given a medication for that symptom, and then the underlying condition goes unaddressed. Um, mm -hmm. So, and that's one of the biggest problems I have. I am highly critical of a lot of the ways that things are done in medicine, but, um, and in your specific case, I was really excited that we were looking at, okay, what could be physically driving some of this depression? Because mm -hmm. we know it's complicated. We know, yes, in most people with depression, there is a trauma component. There is usually a blood sugar component. Like there's things that are pretty common. Um, but what are the nuances in specific? In your case, you had uh, lower testosterone. You did have low serotonin, which I actually don't see all the time um, with depression, but sometimes it does come up. We saw you had a helminth, so which is like a little worm in the intestines, delicious. Um, <laughs> peripheral nervous system needed some support. And so we always get focused on this, the parasympathetic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. But with the when it comes to more of the peripheral, that has a lot to do with adrenal health. So I knew that was going to be important for you. How are we going to focus on regulating that heart adrenal connection so that you could self calm? Um, and that was really interesting. There was a lot of deep anger, like really deep. Um, some sadness, some guilt. Um, I don't remember now where it was sitting in your body. But I do remember there was a lot of emotional stuff that was coming up at the same time. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's really interesting you say that because 2016, that's when I became a travel nurse. I left the South, North Carolina, South Carolina. I got in a car, drove to California, and the very first thing I did was see a Chinese medicine doctor. And he told me the same thing. He said, there's a lot of anger. And I was like, no, I'm not angry. I'm depressed. And it was almost as if it was easier for me to feel depression than it was to feel anger. I didn't even know what to do with it. I never yeah. thought of myself as someone who, who carried anger. I now see how that shows up and you know, the body keeps score. I'm sure you all have listening, have heard of that book, but how can an emotion like anger that's not processed affect someone's physical health? Yeah. Um, and you're definitely not alone in that. I mean, and me too. I don't, I used to always say like, no, I don't even feel anger. I just go straight to sad. Like something yeah. that happens that should make me angry. I just get sad and cry. But that's kind of to me what depression sort of is. It's anger turned inward. And mm -hmm. so when we don't know how to express that and it just is like this damp anger versus an explosive, hostile, ragey anger, um, it becomes a little bit unidentifiable. 
And, and that's the hard part. You know, we're the type of people that might go, oh, I don't want to scream. I'm not comfortable with that. I don't want to punch my pillow. Like, we don't like that sort of thing. Yeah. So then it's how do we funnel that out? Um, it is definitely a thing that, in my opinion, like, can be very much helped by therapy um, or energy medicines, things like sound healing, um, yoga, whatever, you know, whatever's going to move things through. You know, it's at the end of the day, I think it's all transmutable emotions and they do change like one day your anger can turn into more sadness to turn back into it just depends i guess how we're thinking about it and how we're feeling it and it's not specific to women it's men too it's hard for us to because we don't really see that in culture you know we see angry people or angry characters angry men in movies we don't see a lot of other representations of what anger looks like so it can be really easy for us to say no i'm not angry uh it's the first sign you probably are <laughs> Yeah. It wasn't safe for me to express that. There was no yelling where I grew up, which I'm not mad about. But at the same time, if I did have an emotion, I didn't know what to do with it. And I think that's something I don't have children. Um, you don't either. But as, as parents, I think it's really important that you don't expect perfection from yourself. But if and when you have anger, then you show your children this is an emotion and this is how I chose to handle it. Uh, and just explaining what these emotions mean. And we're not broken or crazy. We have to feel what we're feeling. And we're not taught to feel. And actually, we're so against feeling, myself included, for so long. And I'm still working through this. Distracted. Medicated. And I felt great. But it's it the root of it all was still there. And then I believe that's why it manifested physically. And my doctor, who's a naturopath here... She was like, there's this place called Smash Room. Why don't you go there? And you can actually go break things. And I was like, that's kind of cool. I mean, you don't want to do that in your home, but if there's a safe space for that, I mean, that sounds kind of like a fun day, if you ask me. Just yeah. Cathartic. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, you got to find your thing that's going... And, and that's why they talk a lot about chakras, you know, because we do have these areas of the body that can, I guess, become underappreciated too quiet, understimulated, overstimulated, overworked, exhausted. Um, and how do we find that alignment and how do we move that energy back out, you know? And so I think, especially when it comes to anger, for a lot of people, we, we, it's tempting to go, oh, anger, where's that in Chinese medicine? Oh, I think that's in uh, the liver, probably. Some people, yeah. But that's also why I like bioresonance because it doesn't go to the liver for everybody. For a lot of people, it can go somewhere else. Like for me, when I was, so I recently started dating somebody for the first time in like five years. So literally had to freak out for like a month. And in the beginning, I was like, I don't know what I'm feeling. So many emotions. And I was checking myself on my equipment, my bioresonance, and it kept telling me that I was stifling grief in my lungs. And I was having a hard time breathing. I felt like I just could not get a breath. And it was interesting to know. And I was like, wow, this feels almost like I'm sick. Physically manifesting that. But right. it was entirely emotional for me. And so I was like, well, now I'm like, uh, I need a therapist, you know. <laughs> well, I'm really excited to talk more about that because you were single for a while. I was. I was single yeah. for a long time because I was dating, um, you know, and I don't use this word lightly at all because I think it's sort of the, the word narcissist is sort of replaced the word psycho. Like you sound a little bit smarter saying it, but ultimately you're just sort of um, labeling somebody in your past you didn't like, and that's not always fair. Um, however, I absolutely dated somebody who was the quintessential definition of a layman's or, you know, narcissist. Um, and I get a lot of women, female patients specifically who tell me like, I, I can't date. It's been so long. I'm not over, I'm not over it. And the reason why it takes so long to get over it is because at least for me, for a lot of people don't fully understand what happened for a long time because it's so twisty and so confusing and it hits very deep. So that kind of abuse, it's so hard to untangle. And I remember having friends tell me like, oh, he's well, you got to break up with him. He's not treating you nicely. You just got to do it. And it was, it seemed so obvious to them that I just thought they were not wanting me to be happy mm -hmm. or something else because I'm like, no, because I couldn't see it at all. 
So it was incredibly confusing. And since it went on for three years, I think that was enough time for me to just get completely wrapped in and self-esteem kind of destroyed. So I knew for the next five, well, I wasn't planning five years, but <laughs> I decided I wanted to take a lot of time to do a lot of self work, a lot of healing and build up trust back in myself because my therapist said, well, what does trust mean to you? And I said, I'll get back to you because I don't know. And I mm -hmm. um, really think about that because I don't think it wasn't that I couldn't trust people. I couldn't trust myself to pick good ones though. So like I had so much insecurity and that made being vulnerable basically impossible. Um, and it also made me be hyper independent. So when it came to a point of like, maybe I'll start dating again, what a great idea. Um, it led to a lot of panic attacks because I didn't know how to reconcile that part of me that finally felt safe being alone and wanted mm -hmm. to give that up. And yeah, so it's been an adventure. I feel a lot better now. It's been maybe five months now, but the first month was very hard. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, relationships will bring up a lot of stuff, especially if we haven't done anything to work on ourselves after that. I also agree that the, the word narcissist is thrown around a lot. And I did date someone who was clinically diagnosed and this therapist, um, she was like, if they're not willing to own their part and it's only you. And she, she, she was just like this, I don't think this is serving you. And once again, I didn't trust myself. And Tony Robbins, I believe, says this, will compromise our values to meet our needs. We have this, especially if we don't know how to give that to ourselves, we want that, we have that need for love. We also have the values of wanting to be respected and someone who lives in integrity and all that. But if there's that deeper need, then sometimes we can't see it. It's also hard to see when you're in it. And I felt the same way. Oh, people just aren't happy for me. And then don't you think certain personality types, at least for me, I consider myself to be very empathetic. I always root for the underdog because that was me. So you want to, you know, oh, I almost like Beauty and the Beast or something. Like there's, there's yeah. someone amazing in there and you just see this beast. But it's not our job to save anyone. We can't change anyone. And that was a huge lesson. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. I, I had the same thing. And I think so much in our culture, but I say women specifically because I see it more with women, even though it happens to men too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But you know, in our culture, we're as women, we're very much taught to not have very good boundaries. It comes on really early. Like, you know, the, the family member that comes over that seems scary to you because they're too tall and your parents just tell you to hug them anyway, when you don't really want to. Mm -hmm. And it's and you're told to smile consistently your whole life you know and i think it does create a lot of i don't know how else to say it but empathic distress you know right. where we care so much about other people's feelings that it takes over our own feeling and then we go well wait a second i don't feel anger yeah you've never made room for it not once have you made room for it i definitely didn't i think it's a lot to unpack and people ask all the time, do I do trauma work when I'm working my physical health? It is a good question. Like, how do you know when to tackle these problems? And at the same time, how do you do that without, you know, telling yourself on a subliminal level that you're a self-improvement project, that you have all these things to fix, you know? So I do feel that for the most part, when people are dealing with trauma, psychological issues, physical problems, naturopathic medicine with adjunctive therapy can be a beautiful beautiful synergistic way to handle this up and down stuff. And when it comes to trauma work, it can be very triggering. You can bring out a lot of emotions. I think that has to be a very specific personal decision to go into that because, you know, we don't want to make one issue worse by, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole thing. So yeah. it's definitely a valid question and something to really consider. Um, and things change all the time. People can reevaluate what they need to do and what they want to do for their health. So I, I went on a tangent. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> it all flows. So many things that come up. Okay, I've shared this before. When I was 18, I was invited to go to emotional rehab, which was really inpatient psych. And I didn't really understand where I was going. I thought I could leave at any time. I went, like I said, I went there voluntarily. I'm like, we actually need to monitor you because we need to make sure you're not going to hurt yourself. I'm like, what? Because they were asking to take my shampoo. I'm like, why? Why would I need to leave my shampoo? And they're like, well. You're here on suicide watch. We don't want you to drink that. And I'm like, what? And I just felt so betrayed by that system. And I was told that I was going to need meds for life. 
And when I believed that I was broken, which is absolutely what I believed for about 11 years, then I acted in that way. I just gave up on myself. And I didn't know about the things that I know about today. But I met a psychiatrist in 2019 through the medical intuitive who did muscle testing because I, I was really afraid to get back into that system because I didn't feel better. I blew up uh, as far as not my emotions, but my weight, no sex drive. And I was very flat. It's just like I lost my personality. And so if these meds work for you, great. I'm not here to stop you. I absolutely believe in freedom. But... All I was given were medications, nothing about lifestyle, nothing about relationships, nothing about, well, where did this come from? And this psychiatrist in 2019, she said, I would challenge the prior diagnosis and say, it sounds more like CPTSD, complex PTSD. And so over years of feeling unsafe and things like that, that my amygdala had just become super strong. And she said, there's so much that you can do to regulate that. And it was the first time I ever heard that. And I, I cried because I just felt like, wait, I'm not broken. And once I started to believe that I wasn't broken, it changed everything. And yeah, I still struggle, but it was just like, oh, there's something I can do. I felt so empowered. And it, it wasn't just something she said, it was the reality. So how my adverse childhood events, or, you know, it can be a a big T trauma or little T traumas over time. Maybe you're not allowed to express how you're feeling at home or, or something like that. How might that affect the brain and development and contribute to poor mental health outcomes? Mm. Well, it has been shown in research that trauma does change the brain. Mm -hmm. It does. I do see it also in lab work, different hormones shift in certain patterns. You can really see the body shift to adapt when it feels under threat, you know, and that's really what to me trauma is. It's a chronic state of feeling unsafe, um, you know, whether that happened over a minute or a long time. And, you know, a lot of people, I think, go through that same experience, uh, which isn't to trivialize what you've been through at all, but I think it's this idea of, well, you get a pill to fix you. It's the solution to your broken self. And it's a really hard message, mm -hmm. especially when, you don't know if you want to take the pill and you don't know if it's going to help and you're scared to take it and you're told to push through the side effects that, yeah, it'll get better after two weeks. That is a surprise. Norm it's like a hazing period. And there's a lot of messages that I think get interpret or internalized when you take a psychiatric medication, especially when you try to stop and everyone around you is telling you, no, go back on it. Um, and your doctors are saying, well, see, this is evidence you needed it. This is it's an inherent feeling of that there's something wrong, especially when you're told it's chemical, which is the most insane thing ever. Like, oh, it's probably genetic. That's convenient to be able to, I didn't know we were allowed to do that. Just if we don't know, just blame it on genes. That's nice. That seems really easy. And most of the time, people that are, in my opinion, put on psychiatric medication, there's always, almost always a trauma component. Right. And people that have a track experience a lot of times are robbed of the healing and they're shoved into a fix model and i think it's a huge disservice and it creates more secondary victimization and it further leaves the wound open and unhealed well here's what's interesting too i saw something recently about serotonin and how there's not a link for that and depression i will say ssris never did it for me I never liked how I felt, but I do take a, I think a pretty high dose of 5-HTP. I take 300 milligrams a day. Do you think that's high? I don't know. Um, to me, no, but okay. I'm also a mega doser when it comes to supplements. So Okay. So I've stopped that twice and how I feel comes back. So it's not that I necessarily need a medication, but let's figure out what's going on, why I'm not able to create that. What's going on? And so let's say... I mean, obviously nutrition's important, but if I'm in this constant state of feeling unsafe, am I really gonna be able to digest my food? What if there are parasites, you know, other things like that. And I think a lot of us unknowingly become addicted. Our emotional home is being in survival mode. Because when I stopped working for a year when I got sick, I didn't know what to do with myself. I was like, and all of these things came up. I didn't wanna slow down. 
But in slowing down, things came up that I was able to work through. So, okay, if people take psych meds, uh, that's fine. But obviously you help people taper off of them. So why is that? Because they don't, did they feel that it helped them in the beginning and then it stopped? Do you think that it never helped them? They believe that was their only option. Tell me a little bit more about that and which meds too you see the most. Oh yeah. Um, well, most of the medications, especially SSRIs, no better than placebo, you know, and that is not an insult. I think placebo is awesome medicine. Right. Um, but, you know, if it truly was a blockbuster drug, you could give every single person with depression SSRI and they'd all get better, but they don't. A lot of them actually get worse and they're told to push through that. Um, and then it's, well, it's the wrong one. It's the wrong one. Let's try this one. Let's change the dose. And then before you know it, you've got this weirdo cocktail that makes zero sense. I think for a lot of people, it's with the serotonin thing specifically, to me, it's almost more of a correlative finding versus an actual cause. So mm -hmm. I think if someone is depressed, their serotonin will probably drop versus they get depressed because they're low serotonin. Okay. I think that makes way more sense. Um, so in raising someone's serotonin, it might, it might help actually, even if that wasn't the cause, it might help. But for a lot of people, that's really not always the issue. And you could take 10 people in a row that have maybe just general depression for one person. It's, you know, low progesterone, high testosterone, or um, leptin resistance, or a bacterial infection. Like there's a jillion and one things. And so to me, that's sort of the big issue with the DSM, which is the diagnostic book we use, or the insurance code manual, in my opinion, <laughs> to help code people yeah. to get them the right medication. Um, and that's, I think, why that happens that way. It's that we're trying to mitigate and calm down a symptom. And this might sound a little bit harsh, but I think for a lot of times, it's maybe started out in a good place but I think more often than not, it just calms people down. And that's also something that's hard to tolerate is, is this more for you? Is this more to make it compliant for other people? Are you more tolerable to other people? Are you easier to manage to your psychiatrist? It's, it's a rough place to be in. So, and I don't think psych, psych meds with a problem. I just think that they're overused with little evidence. Beautifully said, overused. And do you think there are situations where you would feel that it would be appropriate? Um, I do. I think if someone's dealing with something pretty dangerous, um, like types of mania, types of psychosis, yeah. Um, then yeah, we might need something that works quickly. Um, something like a tranquilizer, you know, and that's really what Depakote is. They, they marketed it later. It was a tranquilizer. They marketed it as a mood stabilizer. It was a branding mm -hmm. technique, actually. So what they did was um, they said, you know what, we, we can't say it prophylactically works against, you know, mood swings, can't legally say that. So they hired a branding team that said, you can call it a mood stabilizer, which implies that it will stabilize the mood and therefore prevent. There's no medical term, mood stabilizer, it doesn't exist. It's not a real medical term, but I digress. That's just my issues with marketing and medicine. <laughs> but the moral of the story is, there are some times where I think to, you know, encourage the safety of the situation, go for it. Most of the time, not. I'd say 90% of the time, I would never do it as a first line treatment. Um, I think for most people, they don't even really want that. It's just that they're told it's their only option and they're told it's their best option, which obviously ignores informed consent. Yes. So this is how I look at it. I'm, I'm kind of in the middle because I'm not against medications. I think the the issue is that no one was asking me, hey, are you um, staying up until four in the morning partying? Are you sleeping? Are you getting sunlight? How stressed are you? Do you have a strong support system? You know, none of those things were addressed. And sometimes if there are actual things that we can address and then we take something where we feel better, the, the issue is still there. So let's do everything we can you know and that also applies to dermatology i had really bad cystic acne and i asked my dermatologist hey this is when i was 17 hey do you think that if i just uh tried taking what was it dairy and i didn't know about gluten at the time i don't think but if i tried taking dairy and chocolate out maybe that would help nope it's not going to help your diet doesn't make a difference and i took accutane and i still have chapped lips from it and um some other side effects but at the time I was like okay well then it was actually nice that I didn't have to do the work of 
changing my lifestyle. So let's give people the tools to have every advantage. If there's still a crisis situation, okay, great. I don't think it's a long-term solution. I'm more on the the side of in an acute situation, there are times where it's appropriate. I've taken care of patients um, and it was vi- you know, a lot of violence or, or whatever. And so bless that medicine. It's just maybe not a long-term solution or your only option. And it can feel like you're broken when you're told you're just broken. So this is how we fix you. And sometimes those exact words are used. Other times um, it's, it's an implication, but I really want to see people take personal responsibility for themselves. But if the doctor's the hero, then, and I don't say that to be disrespectful to doctors, but where's our role in that? And we outsource our power. And I think that also contributed to it. I didn't trust myself. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think a lot of people, myself included, can totally relate to that feeling because when you have anxiety, depression, OCD, whatever, there's a lot of uh, feeling of like your own body's abandoning you and that you can't trust your own brain because your thoughts are toxic because you're hearing all day long, like, I'm not good enough. I can't do this. Um, like, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? It's just on repeat. And yeah. In the beginning, for me too, Julia, try some pause. No, pause affirmations, that's ridiculous. That'll never work. Um, Because it was so far away from how I spoke to myself. I think it's so funny. I feel like one day my business will entirely just be drink more water and read Louise Hay, and that'll be it. And like everyone will get better. (laughs) Actually, yeah, I was on a call with someone who was designing my website, and I was really going through it, and he was like, this is a really great book. I believe it was, you can heal your life. But in the back of that book, it was really cool to see what some of the physical, uh, ailments represented. So I believe this was in there. Maybe it's from somewhere else, but leaky gut, poor boundaries. I mean, that's pretty interesting. And that was something I had and I had absolutely no boundaries. I didn't even know what that meant, nor did I feel confident enough to ask for what I needed. So yeah, it's very interesting. Which book of Louise Hay do you do you like the most, or all of them? Uh, the two I like are "You Can Heal Your Life," um, okay. and I tell people when you read it, you really want to read it the way she suggests, which is you read one chapter every three days, and you say that affirmation in that chapter for I think it's two minutes a day, something like that, and then you know do the whole book that way. That one I think is a great introduction to learning how to be less critical to yourself. Mm-hmm. Because especially with healing, you know, it's like, well, I'll be happy when I'm better and I'll be nicer to myself when I, when I don't feel so bad. And, you know, maybe when I'm not sick, then I will, et cetera. The other book I really like is You Can Heal Your Heart, which is by David Kessler and Louise Hay. And it's about how to grieve in a very kind way to yourself. Um, and a lot of people are scared of grieving books because they're afraid they're going to dig up really scary things and like poke at emotions. Um, but very, very, very gentle. Uh, David Kessler, he said, you know, we're taught in this country, we're taught how to end relationships. We're not taught how to complete them. And that is very important because when people get divorced, they go, well, that failed. Mm -hmm. That's really a big thing to think about. If you look back at 10 or whatever years of your life and you think that failed that's a heavy thing to bear so it does matter how we think and speak and that gets complicated when you have ocd and you can obsess and have magical thinking at times so it does get complicated i understand it's not a perfect system but i do think it's uh, those are the two that i like the best okay so going back to tapering off of psych meds What medications do people typically struggle with the most? I'll let you know what mine was, but I'd love to know that. And what is that process like? The, I think the medications I get the most are the SSRIs. Uh, Benzos I get a lot of as well, antipsychotics too, Um, and the atypicals as well. Atypicals like mirtazapine or amitriptyline, those kind of ones. What about antipsychotics? Antipsychotics like Zyprexa um, is probably the most common one. What's funny is Zyprexa is actually not any better in research from the other ones, but it's marketed the best, so it's the most prescribed. Okay. Um, 
<laughs> oh man, I, I could go on a tangent about that. But so I do see a lot of people wanting off of the antipsychotics because of the weight gain and because antipsychotics will get rid of, they, they dampen the dopamine. So they get rid of that excitation, the mania, but they also will rob you of joy and they'll make you feel flat. No one likes that. So it's a tough thing to deal with. Um, and then with the SSRIs, a lot of people will tell me, like, I got put on this a long time ago. I don't know what for. Or it's put on for migraines. Or OCD helped in the beginning. I don't know if it's making it worse now. I hear that a lot. And benzos, um, that one is my phew, Because benzos are supposed to be a short-term medication for an acute problem. And it's not uncommon for people to be on them for years and years and years. Despite the fact that there are basically no long-term studies um, proving their safety. I will say that's something that I've taken, and fortunately, um, I didn't have any issues coming off of benzodiazepines or Wellbutrin, but Adderall, that was tough. Cannabis, that was also tough. Do you see a lot of people, I mean, there was just an Adderall shortage. Did you, what, what do you, what's the word on the street? I don't know what's, <laughs> how that's affecting people. Oh, all no, right. Yeah, so... It was tough. Um, a lot of my people were driving out of state, calling tiny pharmacies, wow. um, desperately trying to get their hands on like a three day supply till they could try again somewhere else. It was rationed. Um, but it wasn't just Adderall, it was Clonopin. It was, it's a ton of drugs right now that are on mm -hmm. back order. Um, short supply, there's not really a real reason why. FDA is just saying we don't really know why. Manufacturers don't have to disclose why. So it's been very tough, very scary for people. Um, I really hope for people that go through it that as awful as it is, the thing I would encourage is to consider this as maybe something to think about because it's very scary to be dependent on something that is not in your control. Right. Like that pharmaceutical leash, when it gets tightened, is a horrifying thing. And if you know you may not always have access, this will not be the last shortage. Um, it's something to consider because we want to make sure you have autonomy with your health care. And so that's something to, I would say again, just think about that with this. Um, I do see the issue with Adderall is that um, the fatigue is unreal when people come off that. It's not. It's unreal? Unreal. It's yeah, like yes. not normal fatigue. It's yeah. like this complete and yeah. utter exhaustion of everything in the body. And you can't feel it. And know it until you experience it um and that's even scarier because most people tell me whether it's a benzo ssr or whatever they'll say oh well will i be tired like the fear of fatigue in our country is huge because we are so taught to hustle 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 and you literally can't do everything in a day without some sort of stimulus whether it's a medication coffee or whatever it is multitasking left and right so it's number one, scary to be tired. It's another thing to be completely and utterly exhausted and to not know how long it's going to last. It's very scary. I would imagine it has to do a lot with how long you've been on it and your dosage. I was on 60 milligrams a day. I'm not a big girl. I mean, that's that's a pretty big dose. Yeah. Um, and I just remember I had other issues going on because I worked night shift, so my cortisol was bottomed out and I had a little bit at night, but I was so exhausted. And also without a sense of purpose, I think that contributed to my depression. So some people say the opposite of depression isn't happiness, it's purpose. And I didn't really feel that I was, I just kind of felt like I was going through the motions in the hospital, but I didn't know what else was out there. I think a lot of people fear gaining weight as well. And I think I did in the beginning and then it just leveled out. Same thing with cannabis, the addiction specialist that I worked with, she said, give it six months for your brain chemistry to normalize. So we're such a quick fix society that there is an adjustment period for sure. And so something that you help people do, maybe um, would that include what supplementation can help make that process easier so that it's not such an abrupt shift for the person? Exactly. So okay. what, we're, what I like to do with people is two things. One, help make the taper process as smooth as possible. Um, it's never going to be a walk in the park per se, but there are factors we can control and there are things we can do to help rebuild the neurochemistry, make sure the body can detoxify the drug metabolites, the inactive drug metabolites as well. Um, because when that medication in the serum 
is no longer stable. When that steady state is gone, that's when people don't feel good. So if we can, we can tweak that, we can work on that stuff. Um, and things that you mentioned as well, lifestyle stuff, like, you know, eating the, the right things, quote unquote, the right things, sleep, movement, all that. It's very cliche, but the foundations are even more important than they used to be. Because back yeah. in the day when it was like, well, you need to eat right and you need to sleep. And that's my doctor voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking like of this 1950s doctor and, you know, the food at home, it's like fresh pasta being cooked at, you know, and it's, we didn't have box foods. It was before glyphosate, everything, you know, and now it's, we live in a very toxic world. So it's even more essential to do the things that maybe you didn't have to do or our parents didn't quite have to do. So it's, it's too easy to have our circadian rhythms be disrupted. It's, we don't have the luxury of quote unquote cheat days with all the crazy foods we might have used to have. Um, so we do talk a lot about that. I've got people that usually are very intelligent, very already very uncomfortable, um, already struggling, already gluten-free, already dairy-free, already doing everything, you know? They wanna know like what else, because it does get to that point where things will start to make a difference. Um, and that that's a tough place to be, but it's an empowering place to be because mm -hmm. there's nothing more transformative than coming off a of psych med and finding out who you really are and how strong you can be for doing that. And it's a big deal. Um, and that's why I think, especially if it's done successfully, uh, people don't go back on it because the goal isn't just to get off the psych med. It's okay, well, what is really causing it like okay yes. maybe you got on for sleep problems but like why weren't you sleeping let's do that at the same time so that we can sort of control the healing of the body to so tell everybody time doesn't do a lot time is not an active process in healing it's just something that happens whether you like it or not so you know let's do what we can responsibly do and guide that process just like a broken arm you know we don't say well time will heal that not really you know we want to actually cast it guide it and control how that process is going to work so we can get the results that we want because that autonomy is extremely empowering i'm glad you mentioned the circadian rhythm and light obviously night shift completely just destroyed i'm i'm not a night person anyway it was awful but you and i were talking about jet lag and how that for me is a huge thing that, that will just throw me off. And both times that I traveled internationally, it was so beautiful. And I'm not saying I'm not going to do it, but I, I can't hit the ground running at 7 a.m. when my body thinks it's midnight. It's just some people can. I find that perhaps because um, depression is when I'm out of alignment, the, the message from my body, which what I believe it is a message. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what is, what is our body trying to tell us, but what do you think about, um, sunlight and junk light and okay, you can't sleep, but are you looking at your phone? How important is that? Is that hokey pokey or is that a serious, uh, impact on our biology? Oh, oh, it's so serious. It's so serious because I started getting curious about some of these testosterone levels because everyone is low, like men and women. I haven't seen a normal T level in years and, um, I was looking at some of like the charts I was finding from like EU and America and studying those and comparing it to different things. And what I have noticed is there's definitely an interesting correlation between electricity. So like when cell phones came out and how that's been changing our exposure, like, I mean, I've got a thousand devices and not a thousand, but I have multiple devices in my house, you know, compared to like when I was young, it was a one pager. So, I mean, I remember getting our first computer when I was little, we didn't have a computer, right? So, um, I think that there's something huge to be said about electromagnetic exposure because we are electromagnetic beings. We are water. Water is the best current system in the world. So, I think it's not, it's not weird. It's not outlandish. And what happened in the late 80s, early 90s is the cell phone companies completely destroyed all the new research. It used to be cool. It used to be awesome to be Bill Nye and you could study atmospheric science and environmental science and geoscience and that's done. No one does it anymore because there's zero money in it and it's very, very hard to get stuff published without bias and without people kicking your research out who have invested interest. So we don't, we had a ton of data before 1987, but after that, down. Oof, that's when I was born. So they're not go going to be billboards 
paid for by the sun to say, hey, come hang out with me the first 30 minutes of your day before checking your phone. And we forget that we are nature because, well, you know, I get my hair done or I live in a house, but we truly are nature and chronobiology. Uh, there's a, a chronotype quiz that was very helpful and maybe we're not all the same, but that is so important. So over the last almost two weeks, I'm doing a challenge on Instagram and I asked people, can you not look at your phone if you want to first 30 in the morning and get outside? And for a lot of people, they're like, I can't commit to that. I mean, we're so addicted to our phones. I'm guilty of that as well. Mm -hmm. What's that going to do to our dopamine levels? I mean, we're just, we need that fix. So it's almost like we've reconditioned our brains to need constant stimuli. Doesn't leave a lot of room for feeling. And then those things can definitely, um, you know, affect our well being. So yeah, a circadian lifestyle is very powerful. And then here's the other thing. When I wasn't having my phone, I knew that to break the habit, I had to actually put it in a new place. So I left it in the kitchen and I'm in my room and I'm jonesing for it. Like every two to three minutes, I'm like, where's my, oh, it's in the other room. So it's so automatic and obviously thankful for technology because we're here, but I think it's our relationship with technology and the times of day that can can really impact us. So one week of that made a huge shift for me. Really? Is that, is that, do you think people would need to do it longer to notice a difference? You know, cause I asked my audience and a lot of people said they felt better. I don't, I don't know if that's placebo or, you know, they're not waking up to like all the violence on Twitter. Instead, they're just listening to the birds or looking at the sun. But as far as the circadian lifestyle and being mindful of junk light and all of that, how do you, how long do you think it takes for someone to see changes from that? It's probably not going to be 30 minutes like a pill. <laughs> yeah, it'll definitely take time. Um, but I think it's like you, you can pay now or pay later. So when it comes to lifestyle stuff, you pay now, you do the work now, you see results later with medications, you're going to pay later. You know, if you take it now, like whether that's a side effect and diverse reaction, nutrient depletions from the medication, you know, or, um, it's good to take a pause from coping if you can't. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But, at some point, like we have to exercise those coping muscles again, or you won't know how to do it. So, you know, choose where you want to pay. And I think it takes, um, I mean, in AA, they say it takes 30 days to make a, you know, a habit, a habit. But I think a lot of people are like you, where they've noticed shifts from eliminating technology very quickly. I don't think it takes a long time. And that's why mm -hmm. I love hiking. I do it every year with my siblings. We go somewhere, you know, like Germany this year. Um, so, you know, we airplane mode, we go in the woods, like we're not exposed to EMFs. We're on the circadian rhythm. We get up with the sun and we go down with the sun. We eat, we walk all day and I, everything feels better. Like I sleep better. My dreams are better. My mood's better. Um, everything we talk about is different. Like we don't talk about stressful parts of work. Like we don't talk about the media. We just talk about, we joke around and talk about whatever we feel like it of the day. And I think that's a, it's a great example. If you can go, I even had a patient once she was tapering off of Zoloft and she's really struggling. And she told me she had a vacation coming up, um, out of state. And when she came back, she's like, I don't know what happened, but like, I felt so great for a week and now I feel bad again. It's like, right. Cause when we do that, go out of your comfort zone and get reconnected to nature and reestablish your rhythm like a lot of your body will just go thanks appreciate that and everything gets better yes at least okay the last three years i've taken at least one month off of social media last year it was two months the year before that it was three months it's still going to be there waiting for you um but i will say at the time i was in a relationship and i had way more sex whenever i wasn't looking at my phone and then as soon as i went back because i track it um because that is one of the ways that fertility awareness method, but that was a very interesting thing. Wow. So it's like, am I filling up on this instead of connecting with other people? And yes, the, the phone can help us meet people in real life and, and that's great. But in my day to day life, I was more in a relationship with my phone than I was with my partner. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. It's, it's so common. You know, we all struggle with it. Um, I mean, I do, I don't know if anybody's truly special regarding like, oh, I'm, I, I wouldn't get addicted. I think it's just too addicting as it is. And 
it's it's really hard because that's the constant struggle of I think parents especially it's like when do you get your kids a phone and how do you regulate that and how do you monitor it and Oh my gosh, you know, because I can say all day long, do not give your kid a phone until they are 16 and it should not be a smartphone. I can say that and I can mean it. It doesn't take away from the fact that I understand exactly how ridiculous that sounds to ask. Mm -hmm. So I think technology is one of the most toxic, like, things we have. It's the most, it's also helpful and I love it, but it does come at a price. And so it's how do you regulate an addiction? Like, it's trying to eat one potato chip when you've got a house full of chips, like telling yourself, it's just hard. Yeah. Well, boundaries with, Mm -hmm. with the phone, with other people. So that's a boundary that I've set. I'm not looking at it the last 30 minutes of the day or the first 30 minutes of my day. I have all, I have 12 hours that I can look at it. It's really going to be okay. So you mentioned coping muscles. I love how you worded that. And for anyone, whether you're on a medication or you're not, so here's some things. Let me know what you would add to it. Um, you mentioned nutrient depletion. So a lot of these medications, including birth control, fully support your right to choose it. It's not for me, but, um, that is going to deplete nutrients from the body. So some of these psychiatric medications can as well. So if we don't have enough B vitamins, as an example, magnesium, are we going to be able to produce the neurotransmitters that we need? No, no. And great question. So you know, what'll happen, especially like with an SSRI or really any medication, but that's the example. So an SSRI is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So it blocks the reuptake, uh, meaning you have more serotonin in the synapse for a longer period of time. So you have more circulating serotonin in the brain. You're like, that feels pretty nice. Then it does. Um, but your brain doesn't go, well, that's a great idea. I'm really glad that we, you know, blocked that or inhibited that. Your brain goes, well, that's weird. It's not working. Let's make new receptor sites. And now you've got these novel receptor sites that don't work great, but they're there and they're starving. So now you need actually more serotonin stimulus to get the same effect of the drug. So tolerance will take a long time to build up, but it will build up. So then your body goes, well, we need more serotonin. Let's make it. But these drugs are not making serotonin. They're just altering Mm -hmm. how you absorb it. So your body needs B6, magnesium, tryptophan, all these different things to create that. So if we're not getting that, and then the fear that's, do not take 5-HTP with your SSRI, do not take this, do not take that. The amount of fear around supplements is really astronomical compared to like a medication with an insane amount of side effects on the list. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm not saying take them together, that should be under medical guidance, blah, blah, blah. But I am saying it's a lot to ask for your body if, and the body is going to be under a different system now because it's adapted to the medication. So it can be difficult to get enough from food because our food's so depleted. I digress. Okay. So nutrient depletion, that is, that's not necessarily coping, but if you have the nutrients you need, you might be more equipped to cope with whatever situation. And if you take the medication and you feel better, great problem solved, case closed for many, but Could you be missing an underlying healing opportunity because it's a message from the body? And I love the example that you gave about the thyroid. Um, I know fibromyalgia is another blanket diagnosis. Okay, so what's really going on? And if you take a medication and you feel better, it's a lot easier to just say, okay, that's all that I have to do versus digging a little bit deeper and figuring out what it is. But just like you said, you can pay now or pay later. And I would rather invest in my health now, make sure that my organs are working properly and really do some detective work to figure out how can I better support my body so it can do its job. Oh, absolutely. And I think most people want that. Most people want to know why they want to get to the root cause. They want to deal with it. They want to face it. And at the same time, they're also faced with pressure from their family We just want you to feel better. What can we do? We're scared. We love you. It's Mm -hmm. a lot. They're also faced with their own pressure of, I don't know how much longer I can handle this feeling. I'm desperate. So trying to balance all that out. And that's terrible because the real value of wanting to be med free is deep down in there for a lot of people, but it seems like it may not be a realistic option. And that's a very sad quote unquote pill to swallow. Um, So I always tell people, if you are on a medication, use the opportunity. Like if you are stable on a medication, 
great. Go dive in, do the work, take yes. this time to get it done. So you don't have to be on the med forever. So when there's a shortage, you are not scared to death about what's going to happen and being forced into withdrawal because that is really not fun. I think that is a very reasonable stance and I was very against taking anything and it was actually uh, the medical intuitive who did a lot of muscle testing and she's like, it's okay. I took gabapentin at the time. It's okay if it was when I was coming off of cannabis too. She's like, if that's going to allow you to do the work, then for a short period of time and the psychiatrist is recommending it, go for it. It tests well for you, but don't not do the work please know that you have to do both. And it's like legs of a stool. I wish I had a stool that I could show you, but let's, before you take away the medication, you want to find other things to support people going back to the coping muscles. So trauma and you know, people think you have to be raped by your uncle for it to be trauma, but it could be little things that change how we believe and feel about ourselves. So one of the first things I have my clients do is write out all of their limiting beliefs and the stories that come up and let's challenge them and see if they're true. Uh, reframing, I would also say is a good coping skill, looking at the story and changing it. Boundaries. What else would you add to that? What are other things that are helping people be more resilient in that way on their own? Um, I think desensitization, which will happen with sitting with uncomfortable feelings. Okay. So um, what happens is that people get these intolerable, uncomfortable feelings, and it's not reasonable or humane to ask them to sit with that. It's not okay. But what happens is after that, and when the emotions become more tolerable, they're still used to this concept of like, but I can't, but I can't, but I can't. So it's a case of, well, we got to start somewhere. We got to start like feeling it a little, you know, so that you learn you are capable, that you have the ability to do this, that you are not unable or whatever. And that's usually what it comes down to is most people believe that inherently they are either worthless or helpless. And both yeah. of those are pretty unempowering feelings. So I think that's a really big one. And feelings, just like anything at the gym you do, you start out slow, careful, you build a little confidence. You show yourself, yeah, that machine wasn't so scary. Or like, you know what? I, I'll start with the push up on my knees. Just do one. It's fine. And then you build up based on your previous proof to yourself that, mm -hmm. you know what? I could handle that. I'll just keep going a little bit more. I'm glad you mentioned that too, because the brain needs evidence that we can heal. So if you have never seen someone who was really, really struggling and then changed their life and then have a better quality of life actually without medication, then you're not going to think it's possible. You're not going, you're going to say I can't and the brain will find evidence about why that is true. So I think that's really important to mention as well. This is my favorite topic ever because it's so, it's so taboo. Just all, just everything that we're talking about. Um, are you comfortable sharing about your history as far as OCD and did you take medications? Did they help you? What is that like for you now? What's that like? Oh yeah. It's funny now actually, because, um, I dealt with my, I had OCD. It was very severe. And I dealt with it by doing this blog and I would write about everything that I tried and things that helped me and didn't help me because there really wasn't much online at the time. This was back in the early days, you know, before YouTube was, you know, that popular. And I remember I was kind of scared. I read about like Mayo Clinic and Wikipedia. They would explain what OCD was, but it was so sterile. And I just was like, what do they mean by rumination? Like, how do I know if it's normal or not. I just was so hard to understand. I couldn't see a picture. So I thought, you know what? I think I'm not alone in that. And so I decided to do a video blog where I talked about this because I wanted people to see like what it looked like to be a normal person with OCD. And it was healing for me as well because people just commented about their stories and it was like, we were all kind of in this together and it made me feel like, you know, I'm not that alone. I'm really not that weird. This is super common. And, um, I was having a, a rough night. I, I used to go to the hospital a lot because I was always fearful that my liver was failing no matter what. So we were constantly at the ER, my poor ex-husband, <laughs> so let's go back again. And um, I remember one ER nurse came in and she said, you know, your heart rate's pretty high. And I was like, it's always high. And she's like, well, do you, and I was like, well, I just have OCD. And she goes, okay, do you take anything for that? And I was like, no. And she gave me a bottle of Ativan. I had 15 tablets of one milligram. And I didn't take it because I was so, so scared. Um, so 
one night, one fateful night, I was having a really rough time and out of desperation, I was like, just give me the pill. So I took one and within a few minutes, I calmed way down. Now part of that's placebo, obviously, because I believed it would work. And um, part of it was that it was helping me calm down. Um, but I felt what I thought normal people felt like and I was completely in love. And I cared more about this than anything. And it turned into mm -hmm. my uh, recreational interests with narcotics and soma and whatever else I could get my hands on. And I canceled plans to stay home and get high. I just wanted to be alone with my medications. They were safe. They were non-judgmental. I felt better. And I got to get away. And in my, it was just all I, all I ever wanted. So, um, <laughs> um it wasn't until I woke up one day and I was shaking and I had nystagmus, the horizontal vibration of the eyes and this vibration down my spine. I was dripping, just drenched in sweat and I was thrashing in the bed, just screaming and I had no clue what was happening. And I just, you know, didn't know if I could even form a thought. I just knew I was just was feeling terrible. And my ex was trying to calm me down and then it took us a while to realize I forgot to take my pill the night before. And so I was like, wow, this teeny little, and those Ativans are tiny. And I learned yeah. this is my whole world. Like I had suddenly become even more of like, I was whipped into shape. I was reminded about like, Hey, like this is the respect you need to pay. And I was like, wow. Okay. So I wanted to come off the medication. And I think people looked at me like I had four heads, you know, like, uh, cause either like, why would you want to? And also, but you just should stop taking it. Like, why is this a question, you know? And which is ridiculous. There's like one study that came out years ago, sponsored by big pharma saying two weeks and they're fine. Anything other than that, they are crazy and making it up. And that still lives on today. Um, so it took a while. I tapered three times. The third time was the most successful because in my opinion, I didn't want to go back on is also when I use a lot of the methods I use now, um, mm -hmm. lots of natural therapies. I had a lot of physical medicine on board as well. I was doing chiropractic at the time. Um, and I did a lot of, I had also psychotherapy as well. And I had a lot of NDs and doctors on board to help, but no one knew how to do it. So everyone was like, well, we have ideas. I was like, great, I'll try anything. Um, Cause when I get scared, I get very experimental. I, I don't want to not try things. I want to try everything. I'm like, I'll just do it all until something works. Um, and so we tried so much stuff till eventually I was like, well, this is helpful and this is helpful and this isn't. And it got to the point where I was off and then it was like, wow, this is what I need to do. I need to help people come out the other side because it doesn't have to be this journey of akathisia and, and hell and anguish. And it doesn't have to be that at all. And a lot of the dosages are higher and then there's not there. It's not like they make smaller dosages to wean people. So is that where a compounding pharmacy would come in? Or I guess you could cut a pill. I mean, under medical supervision, obviously, but, um, how would someone taper off? Is it a gradual like lowering of the dose? Yeah, people will do, so that's called in my, what I call a naked taper where you're just dose cutting and you can do that with, you know, compounded liquid or like a scale and you can really get the powders. People do other things too, like water tapers, alcohol tapers. Oh my God, don't do that stuff. Um, so, and it can take, uh, you know, a long time because people will do percentage of cuts and they might do a 10% of the remaining dose and you will taper for seven years if you do that. So, and some people, if they do more, they just can't, they just can't. So it, that's where it gets tricky is some people can swim off the meds. Some people are doing these 1% dose cuts and it just goes on and on. Um, so I find that for a lot of people, if we do a supported taper, meaning nutritional support, supplement support, we can help get the body the tools it needs to guide that healing process so that this can be a lot more doable. And we also look for underlying conditions. If somebody's got certain things like, like different infections, like Lyme disease or concussion or, or whatever's going on, that is going to complicate a taper for most people. So that's where we have to do things a little bit differently. And then we, you know, we just take it. It's like a game of chess because, you know, we have to just constantly reevaluate how it's going. And, and the reason why I do that is because everyone's so different with how they tolerate that process. 
like Heather Ashton, who really was amazing. Um, she said, you know what, let's just do 10% cut. She was that person like 30 years ago. Um, and that was really important because before then people were doing 50% cuts. Um, now, the only problem I have with, with that is that it's a very old book um, and she's very specific about don't take supplements. Now, research has come mm -hmm. out since then, um, which is more in support of using supplements for at least street drug withdrawal, but it's very similar. It's very similar stuff. So, and I do find clinically it's more helpful. So a lot has changed and um, I want people to know that there's a lot has changed, a lot's coming out. There's more therapies we have access to that we can do that are useful, that are safe, that are holistic. And obviously everyone can get sensitive and reactive to everything. There's, and that's why it's natural medicine because it's individual, it's specific. So, you know, it's a case of, again, being brave and doing what's right for you and figuring out like, hey, like where does your skepticism fall with your bravery so that you can find the right path? Yeah, it is, it's, it's a journey to go on, but when you have the right support and you have someone who's willing to meet you where you're at and we're, you know, we're all so different. What works for one person is different than what works for another. So if you have that one-to-one -one support, then you can try things and really figure out. And honestly, after I figured out my recipe of the things that helped me, because, you know, I'll go on Instagram and someone says, try Sam E. Well, that didn't work for me. Actually, I felt worse. And that I like Instagram for sharing ideas and just hearing about things, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work for you. So that's, that's why it's good to have someone who has the expertise, who can make suggestions, explain why something's appropriate or not. And um, inflammation is a huge factor. When I do IV ozone therapy, uh, well, that helped my rashes, but I also no noticed that my mood was better. Like I, when I eat a lot of inflammatory foods, maybe not the first few days, but this past month I was eating a lot of sugar. And I noticed that, well, I'm wearing a CGM too. If my blood sugar is all over the place, that has a big impact. Inflammation, um, all of that, and we don't we don't connect those dots. I, I imagine you do, but that's a big piece that we're missing out on too. Oh, totally. And I mean, it's, I mean, I have the same things. Like I'm definitely, you know, even though I've worked very hard to get past the OCD, get past the you know medication dependency, you know, I still have to balance out that like okay this is what i'm doing for my health but also this is what i'm doing for my recreation because yes. i want to enjoy food i want to enjoy my life i don't want to feel bad about not being perfect with every therapy i've got incorporated so it's it's a constant balancing act and you know that's why we talk about the importance of recognizing healthism you know and and it's a big deal because it's very easy. And I, I like Instagram a lot and I love the ideas. I think you said that really well. And there's also this, this thing where we see people doing every like therapy under the sun and eating perfectly. And it's like, well, I got to do that. I got to do that. I got, and the list gets real long. And then it's easy to feel really bad that you haven't done a good enough job at being the healthiest babe you can. And it just yes. it's heavy, you know? Yeah, and so many of my clients think that they have to live the same lifestyle. I'm like, why? We're different people. We have different needs. These are things that could be helpful, but also most people are not posting when they're eating a pint of ice cream or other things. So it just can paint a perception that people live these perfectly healthy lifestyles. And I try to be as transparent as I can about these things. Um, community is so important. And I love the saying, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time around. So you mentioned support groups. So there are some support groups where it's, I don't want to call it a trauma bond, but like it's a um, misery loves company. Oh, this is happening to me. And, and it's okay to acknowledge what you're going through, but I like it more so when it's a group of people that say, I am struggling with these feelings. And also it's not, I am diabetic right? It's not who we are. As an example, yeah. I, I have, I tend to struggle with symptoms of depression. Like the wording is very important because you don't yeah. want to identify as, but the people that surround themselves with other people who are willing to do the work and explore these things, that's so different than people who just want to continue being a victim. And, and our pain is valid, but if we stay in the victim mentality, how are we going to get through that? We just, we just stay there. 
Yeah, we do. And it's, it's in every part of life. When I look back, um, I was going to slay for a while, like Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, because mm -hmm. I struggled with love addiction, which is basically mm -hmm. codependency. Um, and I remember, you know, I, I like similar, like I like certain groups that were more about like, okay, like this is what I'm trying. This is what's helpful. I, I, cause I kind of wanted that more, even though I also wanted the validation of like, this is really hard, <laughs> but. And that's okay. You know, yeah. It's, it's okay to feel it's hard and still have a plan and show up for yourself. So it's like f acknowledging it all. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it is. And, and it's, you know, you kind of go in phases of what sounds helpful to you and whatnot. You know, for at least in my case, I think that's why it was sort of um, a challenge in the first month of dating because I had to, well, first of all, he's the nicest guy. Like, and I had not dated a very nice group of guys in the past. And people, like you were saying about how you are who you surround yourself with, I, you know, was friends for a long time with a lot of people that were in terrible relationships. So I just kind of thought everyone's struggling. Mm -hmm. You know, most guys are terrible, like, and it's just my company, you know? And so when someone had asked me, like, well, who's the healthiest couple in your opinion? And I was like, I don't know any, like, no, they didn't, who is, you have to pick. And I was like, oh, and then I started really noticing like, oh, I like their relationship. That seems pretty nice. And then this one, I like these things they do. That's pretty cool. And when that happened, I started to pay more attention to what they were saying and doing within their relationship. And so when I started dating a very nice person and started getting very uncomfortable, um, I was asking a lot of them like, is this okay? Am I okay? Cause I needed a little bit of training wheel support to know like, I'm good. I'm good with this. Um, because it does take a minute to get used to something different that you're not used mm -hmm. to. And that's why a lot of people will tell me like, Oh, I, I don't like feeling too relaxed with supplements. I get anxious. It's because safety is not always a safe feeling. So it takes a minute to get used to the other side. If you become comfortable in something that you don't want anymore. Yes. So, wow. I would love to do a whole other episode just on codependency because that is very, very fascinating too. Well, I have two more questions, although there are many more that I would love to ask you. Okay. So what do you think about cannabis and brain health? Oh, um, so I very I question a lot of the studies because a lot of them do not give data that I think is pertinent to understand the research, which is, um, are you talking about ingestion from burning? And if so, were they using a butane lighter? Were they using a hemp wick? Valid. Um, like, I don't actually know how that was done. So that changes everything. And I think also, I mean, they care a lot about the strains and the THC potency, and that's good. I do care about that. But I just think we need a lot more to give us more info. Um, I do think that there's something different. I'm just going off the clinical experience, but I see a lot more of um, cannabis-induced psychosis, especially with people under age 25. So mm -hmm. it's just they come into my office, and it's a very similar story. It's they smoked, and it you know started to get paranoid. They continued smoking, and it got worse and worse and worse. Boom, psychosis. Um, I had one kid who... Um, whew, yeah, he came in, um, you could see like this sort of like dark, heavy feeling he had. Mm -hmm. um, and the parents said he smoked the first time and he got pretty paranoid, but giggly. The second time he was paranoid and started hearing voices. Third time, um, and the voices didn't go away when he stopped smoking that second time. So then he smoked the third time, the mm -hmm. voices amplified, and then he jumped off the roof. So, wow. um uh huh. And then people were asking, uh, well, if he was paranoid, that doesn't sound fun. Why would he keep smoking then? That's a really good question. Yeah. And it's because we have what's called allergy addictions, meaning that when you have an allergic response to something or an intolerant response, your body will release endorphins to calm down the inflammation. Your body likes those endorphins. So then you start to go, you know what? Even that bread gives me a stomach ache, I'm craving it for some reason. You want the endorphins yeah. around it. So same thing happens with drugs and medications. Okay. Yeah. I mean, with cannabis, it helped me sleep, which helped my mental health, but then I'm eating all the sugar and I know that that's not serving me. And I don't want to feel as though, you know, any of these things could go at any point and I want to be as self-sufficient as possible, but I'm so grateful for all that it did. And compared to some of the other things out there, 
I think it's a better choice, especially for um, nausea and just and other things. Yes. Okay, so relationships. I know that when I first met you, that was not you were not looking. You were like, nope. I, I, it was it was pretty much a closed door. So were you not looking, and that's how you met your current partner? I wasn't looking, um, and I hadn't been for years. But then I decided, you know what? I'm I'm going to be open because for like a year, I sat on this idea that you can only heal, at least me, certain parts of relationship trauma outside of a relationship. The right. rest is going to happen inside that relationship. But I sat on that for a while and I was like, all right, I'm going to try it. So I got on Hinge and I was like, I'm going to commit to 10 dates from this website or app. Okay. And I was like, I'll do it. So because I committed to 10, I think that kept me interested. Because in the beginning, I was like, I don't know if I want to do this. But when it knew it was 10, I was like, all right, let's get going, you know. Um, and so he might have been, I think, the third person that I met on there, um, like and actually had a date with. And so we'd met for coffee. And I was like, oh, he seems nice, but I think we're friends. And then it was the next time we hung out as friends. He's like, oh, we can be friends. And my my mom called and while well, we were driving together to go to a thrift store. And she's uh, well my mom's boyfriend he's like oh your mom's gonna go to the hospital and i was like oh no and so i was like look i'm sorry but i need to go to my house i'm like five minutes away can you drop me off and he was like no problem but just so you know i think a cab or uber might take a long time if you're gonna go to the hospital i'm happy just to hang out and then i'm happy to drive you there and i was like okay um so and then um i immediately was like well this is weird for me and i'm triggered and he was like why and i was like well because my last ex he never did anything nice for me when it came to going to the hospital so phew, that was a sign i need to go in therapy that was pretty early to bring out that one but um <laughs> so <laughs> we went to the hospital he was amazing he was super kind and gave me the space to be with my mom but he was also helpful and it was a long day it was a really long day and then he texted me and he said, you know, I think this was better than just hanging out because I got to see you in an emergency and see what you were like. And it was really impressive how you stood up for your mom to the doctors. Of course. I did. And if you're open to it, I would love to, to go on a date. And at that point, I was like, OK, that sounds nice because I kind of liked him. And, you know, I'd, I'd heard that before that, you know, not not everybody sees it right away you know, when they're meeting somebody, if they want to pursue it. Mm -hmm. um, so we decided to start dating and, and then I got into therapy immediately because I was so anxious. I was so anxious. I started burping chronic. It was awful. So embarrassing. It wasn't like a cute, like I'm anxious. I'm just sweating. I'm dewy. It was like, <laughs> I was just burping. It was terrible. So <laughs> anyways, but, um, yeah. Therapy was great. I specifically sought a, a relationship therapist. I wanted someone that was going to work with me on the codependency healing part. Even though it's over for me, I still wanted someone that understood. Mm -hmm. And I wanted someone that had some trauma background because I did have some issues with that still related to the relationship issues with narcissism. I think having her on board just to bounce stuff off every week um, so I can kind of make sure I feel comfortable and talk things out, Chelsea with boundaries. So it's been awesome. I feel a lot more comfortable. And so it's been a really good journey so far. Yes. And I love that you mentioned that too, because um, I entered a relationship in what, 2017. And I knew I was like, from day one, I don't know what a healthy relationship looks like or how to have one. So would you be open to doing that? And that's, you're in the honeymoon phase, but I didn't know. And I really wanted to learn and people think that you have to go to therapy or receive coaching or counseling or anything like that when there's a crisis, but it can also be, how can I make my life better? It doesn't have to mean that you're broken. It's just like, how can I, well, maybe there are things I need to heal and how can I learn to maybe feel safe in my body so I can receive love? I didn't realize how much love I was blocking, but just all of that. And thanks for sharing that you did go and that you're, I'm sure you're learning about yourself and they say that. Yes, there's a lot of healing that can be done on our own, but no one's going to trigger us like uh, our romantic partner, especially if we live with them. And also, I've been told by a therapist, if you think that you're healed, go spend three days with your family and you'll find some new things to work through. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's so true. It's so true. Um, 
And I, I love that you got into therapy right away. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's almost, <laughs> it's so funny. I heard a comedian say this. He's like, it's kind of a red flag if you don't go to therapy. Like, <laughs> so, yeah. but it's funny because he had actually brought it up. He saw that I was nervous and he's like, I'm happy to do like relationship therapy if you want. And I was like, I'm being triggered by your niceness. Like, <laughs> so. Um, it can feel weird. It's so If you were used to something different. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, and I, I really wasn't. And it, you know, he had told me it made him a little nervous. He's like, are you ready for this? You know, ready mm -hmm. for someone to be nice to you? And I was like, no, I'm ready. You just got to be a little patient if I'm a little bit stumbly, which I will be. And he was like, yeah, I'm cool with that. And I was like, great. So, um, yeah, it's, I think I will continue to be in therapy even when I feel like I'm quote unquote good because you yes. just never know when something comes up. Yes. And so it's great for a crisis. It's also great to just, learn more about ourselves and how we can connect more and there's always something to work on it doesn't mean that uh we're broken and i think it's important to accept ourselves as we are right now and say i want to become a better part of myself not i'll be happy when i'm in a relationship but learn to be happy and source that from within and then it just complements it because a big trap is thinking someone else will make me happy but then what happens if they break up with you they get hit by a bus you know even if they're very committed you never know. So we have to learn how to do that. And if more people start realizing that it's healthy and it actually improves your quality of life in your relationships, then that work doesn't seem so taboo. It's, yeah. it's something I love. I love it. Oh, absolutely. Because I, the thing I value about the time I spent single was I really enjoyed my own company and I learned mm -hmm. to like being independent. <laughs> And so I'm not in a place right now where I'm afraid of being lonely. So there's not this terror of like, we can't break up. We can't break up. And this fight's going to lead to a breakup and then I'll be alone. That's over. So wow. I feel like, sure, I'm sure it'll be triggered at some point again, of course. But for the most part, I'm enjoying the relationship so much because I want to do it. I don't feel like I need to do it. And if we have a little tiff or something, it doesn't derail my whole day. Um, it's I'm able to compartmentalize that because I have a rich life and he's part of my rich life, but it's not the entire thing, you yes. know, which is really, really important because it allows me to also give him a person who's more well-rounded and has more interesting things to say and do besides just be obsessed with the relationship. Yes. I mean, not to put you on the spot, but would you be open to doing another podcast like specifically on codependency and what you've learned and just about relationships and all that, because I think that's such yeah. an important topic. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's such an important one. It's a common one and so many people are dealing with it and yeah, it's, it's not unusual for people to go through healing journeys. And then, I mean, like, even for me, I remember OCD got better and we got divorced real quickly and it wasn't because he did anything wrong. But after I had done so much work for a long time and we couldn't relate anymore to the dynamic we had. Right. So we actually had a really nice divorce. It was as far as they go, but I had, I changed a lot. We did not grow together by any means. And so I think it's, um, you know, that's a scary part of healing sometimes is when, you know, your family members want you to sort of stay the same. You yeah. Know? Well, and just learning, and all the lessons about how to have healthy relationships because it's not modeled for us. But you mentioned a rich life and I love that because that is, in my opinion, as I get older, one of the most important things. Uh, you can have all the resources in the world, but if you don't have anyone to, to share it with and to connect and, you know, a lot of people isolate when they don't have, uh, at least I do with depression or low self-worth or other things. and. It's actually really beautiful. And maybe we were surrounded by assholes at one point. Maybe, maybe I was the asshole. You never know. But there are amazing people, but our brain needs evidence that that exists. And it sounds like you two have a great line of communication. We can be, he, you have the safety to be vulnerable about what you're feeling. So you don't internalize that, create a story, and then just run with it. You can, oh, get it absolutely. Because I'm definitely not the, like, you know, I recognize that for a long time in many relationships, I felt like I'm the broken one and I'm lucky to be dating this 
awesome person. Same. And yeah. now dating, you know, this individual, like, yeah, he's got a life behind him too. Like, it's not just me, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's really nice because, you know, we both said in the beginning, like, we need to talk and communicate. And if we're upset, we need to bring it up, like, right away and not sit on it. And it may be uncomfortable, but I think it's, you know, just part of where we're both at because we're both in our late 30s. And um, I know what I'm not willing to do. And in the beginning, I was like, here's my list of must-haves and deal breakers, just FYI, you know. <laughs> and um, <laughs> he showed me his as well. And then uh, we made some new ones together, which was kind of fun. So it's, um, I think that's why I like what we're doing at this point is that, you know, I I know I need to be in a relationship that's going to allow me to continue to heal um, old stuff, you know. Yes. Not just, like, everything's done, let's just date. Like, no, it's, it's got to be a healing thing, too. I'm so happy for you. I really am. It's Aww. it's really beautiful because, you. I mean, you were pretty set in stone that, I don't know if that's, if that's for me. And just... I see you guys, you're so cute, you work out together, and it's like, how can we have our own lives and still have a life together? So I would love to do a part two, even just on relationships. There's so many things. Yeah, let's do it, thank you. This is definitely my longest episode, but it's because I, I love talking to you. It's the real stuff that people are afraid to talk about sometimes, but I hope that other people realize we all have insecurities, we all have these things come up, and we can choose to believe that we're broken or we can choose to see it as an opportunity okay how can i work through this so that i can better connect with people and that's you know the mindset piece of just what's another way to look at this and it's yeah yeah now look at you you know you just get to have that love but that's not your primary source of love it's just adding to it's the cherry on top with what yeah. we create for ourselves yeah i thank you i know i i really feel that way and it's you know, because I have so, oh my God, I feel like we just talk for literally forever. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, let's, I mean, let's definitely do one on relationships, codependency, narcissism, all the good things, healthy love. I mean, I think that's the one thing I see a lot with, and I relate, the people that I have that are in these really toxic relationships, it's the same belief I had. I guess there's nice people out there, I guess. It's just really, really tough to swallow that concept that, and I had a therapist tell me that. He's like, you know, there's more healthy relationships in the world than bad ones. And I was like, okay. Like it just didn't make any sense to me that most people were in good, thriving, healthy relationships. I thought they were all variations of toxic and a few lucky few out there. Yeah. So it's, you know, and I think that's why, um, I don't know. I could go on a tan I'm sorry. I'm just like a million miles an hour right now. Yeah. It's just, I mean, but whatever you, the RAS, the reticular activating system, if you're used to seeing that, you're going to find it. And then I went to college and I saw people who were happily married and they were great partners. I'm like, wait, your life can be better. It's about picking the right partner and you're going to have issues. We're going to have issues. Whoever we're with, who do we want to have them with? How well do we resolve conflict? Can we communicate? Do we trust each other? Do we respect each other? and hopefully give each other the opportunity for growth. So mm -hmm. yeah, okay, that'll be great to just continue and just what we've both learned because yeah. I think storytelling is so powerful versus mm -hmm. like I'm some experts, just like this is my lived experience, this is what I've learned, kind of mortified by some of the ways that I showed up, but hey, it, at least that shows growth. That's how I look at yeah. it. Oh, okay. 100%, it's, it's, I'm a narrative person too, and I think most people are. So yeah, let's, let's do some campfire. Let's do some stories. Yes, okay. So how can people work with you? Tell us about your offerings, and obviously the bioresonance scan, which straight up, I was like, I don't know about this. It was so cool, both times that we did it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't, I don't know about this. And it's really incredible. So I encourage people to check that out if that's something you're interested in. And if there's a website where you explain it more, will you send that to me and I'll put it in the show notes? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, people want to work with me or see if we would be compatible. Check out my website, read what's on there, get a vibe, see if it sounds good. Um, that's www.drjuliabritz.com. B-R-I-T-Z.com, okay? Yeah. 
And then um, also I'm pretty active on Instagram as well. Um, if you want to DM me there, that's totally cool. Um, I've got older stuff on YouTube for the OCD things if people want to watch all that. There's a lot of stuff I have. And then in terms of if they want to, if people want to work with me, then I do have a clinic in Las Vegas, but I, all, I see most people via telemed. And I'm really passionate about telemed and um, telehealth, so I love doing it. We can do bioresonance from anywhere if you send me DNA. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Most people like it. I don't do it with exactly every person, but um, a lot of people do. I'm just so helpful, so we kind of just want to do it. Yeah. Do you do a discovery call with people to see if you're a good fit before working together? I do, and I, I'd say percentage-wise, maybe 30% of people I I. I will say like, hey, we're probably not. And it's mm -hmm. because A, I think there might be someone more appropriate or I don't mm -hmm. feel like it's a safe fit. Um, mm -hmm. And that's because I've worked in mental health for a while and we have to make sure you're gonna be successful at home and safe at home. Yes. Um, and most people are, um, but I do have a good, um, pretty good referral network of people if, if I do think, or if they think, you know what, this isn't quite right. you know, yes. And that's important because we want to make sure going into it because supplements cost money. This all is not insurance stuff, and you know, natural right. is not insurance. So, if you're gonna put in the money, and I'm gonna put in the energy, and we're all gonna work as a team, like we both have to feel really good about that. Hard agree, absolutely. It's got to be a hell yes. Otherwise, you're not gonna be fully invested, and someone can have all of this expertise, but if you don't feel that they care, or what's the saying? You don't. You don't care how much someone knows until you know how much they care. Like you just have to feel that it's a good fit. So I'm the same way for coaching. If I feel that there's a better fit, I'd rather them work with someone else mm -hmm. because I don't want to waste my energy and I don't want to waste their time or resources. So, okay, amazing. Well, thank you so much for being here. Anything you want to say before we sign off? Oh, thank you. I'm just so happy that I, you know, you're doing this. I love that you've got a podcast now. So I think you're an amazing resource for people and, um, You've got a great podcast voice too, so yay. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. Um, so yeah, two episodes a week. It actually at this stage hasn't launched, but any day now. And I just want to bring people on. So if you're listening to this and there's someone that you think has a very powerful story, I don't care if they have a big following. I mean, it's about the impact and the message and mm -hmm. just hearing people realize it's okay to go within and you don't have to be who you've always been but sometimes you have to look under the covers and see the boogeyman but but then it's okay then we can move through that and there's on the other side of finding fulfillment from within it's just a better life so I'm so grateful and I'm grateful that you're able to help people with this too you've helped me a lot and yeah thank you so much for being here today Awesome. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you for listening to the High Maintenance Hippie podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast, rate it, and leave a review, ideally a five-star review if you loved it. All of this is free of charge and really helps me to be able to run the podcast. If you take a screenshot and tag me, I'll repost you and shout you out on Instagram. So tag Ashley Taylor Wellness and High Maintenance Hippie podcast. If you have any feedback or guests that you'd like to have, I would love to hear from you so that I'm not just talking at you. I really want to deliver things that are valuable. So send me an email with any feedback, suggestions, or ideas for guests at ashley at ashleytaylorwellness.com. And I will leave you with a disclaimer. Please know that this is not medical advice or replacement for seeking medical care. Everything discussed on this podcast is for educational and informational purposes only. Always consult with your medical provider before making any changes. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you next time.